Moving along, we also have just the idea that they look like they fit together. So the continents kind of look like they fit together as puzzle pieces. So which connections can you see? Which ones can, if you smush them together, look like they belong? So if you look around, see if you can notice some. The most common one that people come up with is here. South America looks just like it fits into Africa right over there. So that's the most obvious fit of all the coastlines. Now, of course, it's almost like they were puzzle pieces that got shaved around the outside of it, that got eroded away. So that's why they don't fit perfectly together. But at one point, they most likely did. And then they moved away over time. Another thing is that there's rock deposits that match from continent to continent. So right over here, we have similarly aged rocks from 550 million years ago on both sides. They're like identical, but they're separated. Same thing over here. So right over here, we see coal deposits. Now, coal is formed in an interesting way where there's different layers that get smushed together and then they form, uh, like it's basically dead plant and animal matter that form together. But look, there's an identical type of coal that forms all throughout this ridge right over here. So that's why it makes sense that maybe it was all one together, one long mountain chain because they match up. So if you look over here, you can see that this is very particular organization layers of sediments right here. You can see at the top, you have a certain type of basalt lava flows. You have sandstone, shale, coal, glacial till at the bottom. Now, if you look at that, it's almost like a barcode, like the way that um, we, you, when you check out at the grocery store, they might scan the barcode and be like, okay, this is what this barcode represents that. So these rock layers form like a barcode where it has a very distinct type layer. And when you find this identical rock layer on different continents, that's what tips you off like, wait a minute, something's up. This would not naturally form on its own unless they were all together. So that's one of the versions over here. And you can see right over here the different rock layers and how they spread throughout and how identical that they are. And this is actually one of the ways that we can figure out how old certain fossils are too, because when they form in this part, if this was 150 million years ago here, it's the same thing over there. And then this is how we can date certain types of fossils. Another thing is that the mountain chains look like they match up. So the mountains on a different continents are basically identical. It's one long mountain range that was once together and then they separated. So the Appalachian Mountains right over here, which is closest to us, is really similar to the mountain range on the top of Africa over here. Um, actually, you could uh, one of the reasons that the Appalachian Mountains are so much smaller than like the Rocky Mountains on the closer to the West Coast is that these formed much longer time ago. And when these things collided together in the first part, that's what pushed up the mountain ranges together. But then over time, when they separated, nothing is pushing up on it anymore. So it just erodes over time and it's only going to get smaller. The last thing I'm going to say is what are called glacial grooves. This is the last piece of evidence over here. So you could see these lines in the rock, right? And you could see how all these lines are moving away. So once upon a time, there was, when the all these continents were together, it also went through different ice ages. And there was these thick, thick ice sheets. Some ice sheets were like a mile high that went up. And then over time, the ice sheets um, did melt. But as they moved... Right? They took rocks that were at the bottom of it and they grinded them against the lower level of the rock. So you can see over here, these deep, deep grooves make a very specific pattern. It's just like that barcode I was telling you about earlier. And you can see these lines that are being dragged through. The way I like to imagine it is, have you ever seen the movie The Incredibles? There's a part where Mr. Incredible fights a robot and he realizes the only thing that can destroy the robot is itself. It's the only thing that's strong enough to puncture through the robot. So it's kind of like this. The ice itself is not going to leave this marking, but the ice is pressing down on the rocks and then it's taking the rocks and scraping it against the other rocks and that's what causes these deep grooves. If you, look, if you look over here, there's a couple of examples of some more glacial grooves. The reason why it's... Um, included these are, I took these pictures. This is actually in a place very close to us called Harriman State Park, which is one of my favorite places to go hiking. And I remember I just got really excited when I looked down, I was like, I recognize these. These are glacial striations or glacial grooves. And this is the type of evidence that um, my main man, Alfred Wegener used to prove his theory of continental drift. So I just thought it was so cool that you can basically, you know, drive 30 minutes away and see what I'm talking about for your own eyes. 
Another thing that you see, two other pictures I took when I was out hiking, these giant boulders that are in the middle of the woods that you'll sometimes see, like how did these giant boulders get there, right? What could carry something that big and just drop it off right there? And how come so often these glacial boulders look so different than everything else? Well, these are referred to as glacial erratics. And erratics mean they're kind of weird. They look different from everything else. That's because, again, with that ice age I was telling you about, the, as the glaciers moved, they flattened out some of the areas, but they also carried these gigantic boulders on top of them. So as they moved, sometimes the boulders would then fall off and then find, wind up in an area where they were no longer there from, they, they were no longer used to be. So this is why those glacial erratics show up. And here's some famous examples of a bunch of different glacial erratics. If you look on the bottom left, you might notice I've been in this area too. This is a, an Acadia National Park up in Maine. And there's a really cool one. A lot of people like to pose underneath there as if they're being crushed by the rock because it, it's like an optical illusion there. It looks like it's about to fall off, but it's very steadily there. Like if you gave it a nice push, it's not going anywhere because it weighs a lot. Keeping all this in mind, okay, you just heard all the pieces of evidence right here about Alfred Wegener's theory. So the question I have for you now, take all that information in. Imagine that you are a scientist, a geologist, right, in the year, let's say, 1917, roughly around that time. And you're hearing the information for the first time from Alfred Wegener. He's given his big proposal. He laid out all of his evidence, okay? It's not that he didn't have evidence. He had a lot of evidence, okay? That's important. A lot of evidence. He just gave you all those pieces. If you were a scientist then, would you have believed him? The other idea that people had at the same at the time was that it was the constants were always where they were, that they never moved, and that perhaps there used to be these things called land bridges that connected them, that they went away over time. We know that certain land bridges existed between, like, let's say, um, Russia and Alaska, that there used to be like a pathway during the ice age where you can like walk across on that ice, but then that melted away and disappeared. So some people assume there must be other land bridges and that's how these animals got across. That's one possible thing, but it's, we never found those evidence of that. So the question is, do you think that it was accepted at the time? Yes or no? I want you to think about it. Make your prediction. Are you ready? The answer is that Wegener's theory was not accepted because he could not explain the force that moved the continents. He had a lot of evidence, a lot of evidence. However, he the key part, like what is strong enough to move these continents apart, he just couldn't imagine what that would be and he didn't have enough evidence to prove that specific part of it. So what was the force that moved the continents? He did not know. And um, it went unsolved for quite some time. So. Tune in next time to figure out what did um, cause all that to happen. I'm going to just leave you this image right over here. I love this image because it kind of shows Pangea, but where the original, like where all the um, land was in this particular example. And then this is a fun video right here showing how theoretically the continents broke apart, how they handled this in the movie Ice Age. And I'd love for you to watch it and see how many different inconsistencies or mistakes can you point out based on what you just saw. So... Good luck.